Hi everyone. So we're going to be starting in a second. Oh, it looks I, like I'm I, just assuming the game is over and you're going to tell us the score. I don't know what the score is because I won't oh. pay attention <laughs> no, to the no. game. Okay. Nil nil apparently. <laughs> oh, okay. Uh, uh, we were, for anyone who doesn't know, the World Cup was uh, playing in the Games Institute collaboration space until a couple seconds ago. So uh, that's why we're running just a, a little behind. Um, we have a uh, mostly online audience today and a few people uh, in person. Um, so I'm just going to uh, give a, can everyone, first of all, hear me okay? See me okay? So, okay, great. Um, so I'm just going to give a quick uh, introduction to the Games Institute for um, those who are joining us who uh, might not know. Um, I'm Dr. Emma Boston, and I'm the Research Communications Officer uh, here at the uh, Games Institute, or the GI as we call it. And uh, what that is, is it's a, a research institute at the University of Waterloo um, for researchers who are seeking to advance the study, design, and purpose of interactive and immersive technologies. Um, and that kind of obviously ties into what we're going to be discussing today. Um, so we endeavor for the Games Institute to be a place for researchers of all backgrounds to come and work together and learn from each other um, beyond the boundaries of individual discipline. Um, and it's important for us at the Games Institute to recognize the enduring presence and deep traditional knowledge, laws, and philosophies of the Indigenous people with whom we share the land that we live and work today. Uh, we are working to continually make space for Indigenous scholars, designers, commentators, and creators, and to uplift all voices that are marginalized, uh, both within uh, the academic and gaming context. So we acknowledge that the land on which we work and live today is the traditional land of the Attawadaran, Anishinaabe, and Haudenosaunee people, and the University of Waterloo, where we work, is situated on the Haldeman Tract, which includes 10 kilometers on either side of the Grand River. Our ability to be living and working here now in the Waterloo region and in Ontario is a direct benefit of policies of expulsion and assimilation of Indigenous people during uh, the time of settlement and confederation and since. Um, so we have a responsibility as such beneficiaries to acknowledge and understand both the history and, cur and current experiences of First Nations, Inuit and Métis people, and for this understanding to inform the work that we do so we can stop perpetuating the damages of colonization and begin to repair them. So land acknowledgements like this are obviously just one very small first step in doing that work. Uh, if you want to learn more about the Games Institute or our commitment to anti-racism, decolonization, equity, diversity, inclusion, um, please check out uh, the Games Institute website, which has lots of information on all of those. Um, so, uh, so today I'm joined by uh, Christina, Steve and Jen here, and we are going to talk about games and education. Um, in a very broad sense. Uh, and so I just wanted to start off um, letting them sort of introduce themselves. Uh, all three of the panelists have uh, worked in games, interactive technologies, and education, um, but all from very different backgrounds, and all of you have very different experiences, very different projects. Um, so to orient the audience, uh, do you think each of you could take a few minutes to introduce your work in this area? Um, so, And this could be research, research creation, administrative, pedagogical. I feel like for this panel, all different types of experiences is relevant. Uh, Jen, do you want to start? Because you're at the top. <laughs> yeah, yeah, I would uh, love, love to start. Um, thanks to Emma for that introduction and land acknowledgement and, and to everybody who, who's coming and tuning in. So my name is Jen Whitson. I am a associate professor cross-listed between sociology and legal studies department and the Stratford School of Interaction Design uh, and Business at the University of Waterloo. And so I for I've been studying um, what's called production uh, studies, like looking at how game developers make games, the soft and squishy side uh, of making games, particularly the socioeconomic sort of thing. So what happened to game development when we moved from console games to um, mobile casual games and we started designing games for addiction but also for like monetization and compulsive play um, and, and data collection and and so how did that change game development processes and, and most of my work actually looks at how designers uh, collaborate in the absence of consensus how do they build a game when they have differing visions of what they want to do but also what are the working conditions like and and can you actually have a career get paid doing what you love and, and which people are actually more likely to to 
survive in those careers and which ones aren't. So that looks at a lot at um, gender and, and race and, and where you live and all those, those demographic factors that um, um, look at who can sustain games work. Um, when I was hired, of course, I researched game development. And so everybody thought that perhaps I could teach game development. So I have had experience teaching capstone courses where students were tasked with making games and they were tasked with making games for a client in Jamaica. Uh, so that was even more interesting uh, where they were prototyping tabletop games and, and, and games for, you know, hotels and things like that. So that was that sort of like learning through the hard side. Um, I, I spent a few years doing ethnographies uh, of game studios and game incubators and following studios around. So I guess that kind of translated, but this is sort of the hard place that many game studies educators are put in is that they're hired uh, and then they're, they're sort of asked to learn how to teach how to make games when they don't have experience themselves doing that. And I have also used games in, in sociology courses as a way to illustrate dense theoretical concepts uh, and, and to help students sort of learn and engage on that, that other sort of interactive level and I've and I found that that that's been much more successful yeah so um current project sorry before I move on uh indie interfaces which looks at uh independent um sort of game studios and and creators and some of the challenges that they have uh, as well as the first three years project which looks at games education specifically and follows people in the last year of their game designer development programs through the first years three years of their careers to, to figure out what, what that industry is really, really like. And where do all of these people, we know that most of them lead, where do they go? Where do they end up with their degrees? And how can educators, educators better prepare them to survive? Thanks for that, Jen. And we'll definitely return to the idea of uh, uh, researching versus teaching uh, game develop and design later on, because I feel like you uh, definitely hit on something specific there. Um, I was just going to ask, can, can you guys hear all right as far as the volume goes? Yeah. OK, um, so uh, Christina, do you want to go next? Sure, thanks very much, uh, Emma, and thanks for putting together the, the panel. Um, I am a professor of social development studies at Renison University College at the University of Waterloo. Um, and I really study history and education uh, with a particular focus on community driven curriculum development and oral histories and education um, is really a passion. So in many ways, I would say years ago now, um, I guess maybe six or seven years ago, I sort of fell into an interest in games um, as what I would classify as a non-gamer. So I have imposter syndrome all the time in the GI because I am not this like a wildly avid gamer, although uh, my children are really getting me into some games. Uh, sadly, I now know what Clash Royale is and play it with them. Um, but um, I am actually really interested in um, how games are used specifically to teach history education. So I am the principal investigator of a project called Digital Oral Histories for Reconciliation, the Nova Scotia Home for Colored Children History Education Initiative. It is a way too long a name, so we just refer to it as DOOR. And DOOR is a community-driven project that involves VR and history games in a curriculum unit that we've created that teaches young people about the Nova Scotia Home for Colored Children. So really briefly, for those who don't know, um, and it's it's a history that many people don't know, um, the Nova Scotia Home for Colored Children uh, was opened in 1921 as a segregated care institution for African Nova Scotian children um, just outside of Dartmouth, uh, Nova Scotia. And it was open for over 70 years in different iterations. Um, there were hundreds of young African Nova Scotian children who were there um, who suffered uh, abuse in the home. And so um, this abuse was from years of systemic racism in the province that manifested itself in the institution, which we know happens in many care institutions. And the former residents um, decades ago really uh, called out for there to be redress of this harm and for the province to be addressing systemic racism historically and its ongoing iterations. And so the former residents actually uh, initiated a restorative inquiry, not to assign blame, as they say, but rather to uh, seek to redress the harm um, and come up with ways to move forward. And they call this their journey to light. It is ways of looking back back in order to fly forward. And they use the symbol of the Sankofa bird, which I could explain at some point as well. 
And so part of that restorative inquiry um, was an educational mandate. And so they wanted to be able to educate young people about their experiences of the home, why the home opened, what happened to them in the home, and what can be done um, to move forward uh, towards justice. And that is where uh, the DOOR project came in. They, it is an oral history based virtual reality um, program and interactive storytelling where uh, young people uh, learn from their oral histories in the sense of a, a place um, of the home, because of course that sense of place, the actual home itself is so critical to the stories and it involves a much wider five part lessons um, that uh, the VR is just one part of that. So uh, from that, I'm also I'm part of a partnership grant for SHRC um, that is called Thinking Historically for Canada's Future and the co-lead of the curriculum and resources cluster for that. And we are looking at what kind of resources and curriculum are used in schools for history education. And part of that is an examination of where games that are increasingly showing up in schools fit into uh, that work. So I come to this from a perspective of someone who uh, focuses on looking at um, education, specifically historical games, and um, and even more so really around equity issues. Um, and so, th so that's where my window into this work comes from. Thank you so much, Christina. That that's that's amazing. Uh, Steve, do you want to go there? Okay, thanks. Um, I guess I think I'll just start off by recognizing that. Uh, thanks, Emma, for setting up the panel. But uh, also for those don't, that don't know, Emma is a very accomplished game scholar in her own right, and was as every right to be on the other side of of a panel uh, of this nature as well. So I just wanted to to get that out of, off the top. Um, my name is uh, Dr. Steve Wilcox. I'm an assistant uh, professor in uh, Wilfrid Laurier's uh, Game Design and Development Program. Um, we launched in 2016 and uh, with a, a primary focus on essentially social impact games. So games that could have a positive impact on, on society um, and in various ways, shapes and forms. And um, I joined that right when it was uh, kind of taking off. And so I've been uh, embedded as part of the curriculum developments, course uh, developments of the program and iterating on, on various versions of, of what a social impact curriculum would look like and um, what it would prepare students to do, how that changes um, the fundamentals of game design, but also what does it look like on the other side of, of graduation? You know, a, a lot of game design programs and, and curricula and pedagogy are all oriented around uh, entertainment focused games, games that kind of can replicate existing genres and existing paradigms and essentially existing business models. Um, and uh, a social impact game or career is, is very different in that in that nature. And so it requires a lot of thinking outside the box and, and also engaging with a lot of the broader issues that we're seeing across academia about um, preparing people for the next job or preparing people for, for life um, versus uh, all sorts of uh, issues with tech and inclusivity um, and equity. Uh, all those issues are, are very much prominent um, in our program and in the academy more broadly. Um, as a researcher, I do uh, community-based research projects through um, game design. Um, my research focuses on social cognition and play. So social cognition is really um, how other people perceive, think about and interact with the world. Um, and I look at play as a means of helping us engage in that activity with more accuracy and more fluidity um, in ways that can hopefully um, lead to more depth in terms of what we call intersubjectivity. So our ability to think of the world from the perspective of other people situated in the world. Um, so my first project in that nature was uh, working with uh, food allergic children um, in Canada who actually sadly experience higher levels of, of bullying and, and harassment in schools due to their food allergies than the average, the average um, child would. And so through interviews and um, through illustrations of their lived experiences in schools, um, I kind of condense that down into a representative character and then players um, help uh, follow that player as she moves to a new school and she's the first child there with a food allergy. And so you have to navigate the same social situations that she did, which were based in the literature around those common, essentially tropes of, of a, a child's experience navigating um, school and social situations as someone with a food allergy. Um, again, based on that principle of social cognition, if people can better understand the, the lived perspectives of other people, then 
hopefully they can better um, engage with and, and treat more compassionately those people. I'm carefully avoiding the word empathy here because it's a very loaded term. Um, and I, I, I have lots to say about that that I won't cover here. But um, uh, so I, I worked on, on that project. I've also worked with um, uh, the um, uh, Canadian Public Health Association and an uh, organization called uh, VEGA. Um, both around um, healthcare and providing uh, inclusive, equity-based um, healthcare, especially around um, race, gender, um, and sexual orientation and, and exclusion um, and, in the Canadian public health sense. And then with VEGA, it was dealing with um, uh, family violence as it's kind of seen in, in clinical practices and how to recognize and respond safely to indications of family violence. So um, as a researcher, I, I'm very much driven by developing a theory um, and then applying it and then revising the theory and then applying it and then revising that cycle um, is something I try to live by. Um, I'm an avid gamer myself, but really I, I think of myself as a communications scholar that just approaches play as, as really the main driver of learning and knowledge acquisition. And so I, I, I don't thumb my nose at any other forms of media. I come from a lit and, and comics background. Um, and I just I really uh, am enthused about the potential for play to to take on maybe even a, a bigger role, per se, in, in the 21st century than that we've seen leading up to it. Perfect. Thanks, Steve. And I feel like I should mention uh, Jason, uh, who was also supposed to be on this panel, um, but uh, got COVID, so couldn't be here today, uh, you know, even digitally. Uh, and uh, Jason uh, is has an interesting perspective on this issue as well, because uh, he was instrumental in starting uh, Canada's first Masters of Game Studies program, um, which I think might be, I don't even know if it's just Canada's first. I, I don't think there's many, there's not many game studies specific focused programs. Um, they tend to be more focused on uh, design and development. Um, so that was some of the perspective that um, I was hoping that that uh, he could bring. But uh, Steve, I think you have a lot of that um, administrative uh, uh, perspective as well. And Jen has uh, seen uh, in those studies, uh, uh, the studies that, uh, that they're working on a lot of that too. Um, so I just want to, before we dig into some of these more extensive issues, thinking about education as a whole or the industry, um, I wanted to start with what most people, I think, think of when they hear the words games and education, um, which is, you know, uh, using games in the classroom or um, using games to teach non-games related topics. Um, so I guess I just wanted to ask you guys, because you all have experience with that, um, you know, what are what are some of, in your experience, using games in, in the classroom or creating games that to be used in the classroom, you know, what are some of the significant um, pros and cons that, that come up? And anyone can, anyone can jump in and start. I, I can uh, jump in and, and start. So I have used games uh, in, in my sociology class, and, and I think there are a few things to keep in mind. I mean, obviously, for if you're not somebody who lives and breathes games, finding appropriate games that are good games that like connect with the students um, that actually connect with the theories or, or the concepts that you're trying to teach can actually be really, really difficult because you don't even know where to start and how to curate or how to assign them. Even more so because you might find a good game, but it's only available on PCs or it's only available on, on mobile. And, and so you actually need to think about accessibility and, and ensuring that the game is available on a number of different platforms and that the game is available for free <laughs> because students uh, commonly don't have the extra funds to pay for the games and that the game is actually you can play through it or, or get some of these um, the social cognition sort of elements that Steve is talking about that you can really understand those in depth but also in a limited amount of time that that students have to deal with that um, or to dedicate to that like just like they would for reading a chapter so something that you can get the heart of it in, in like an hour or two um, and th that's a really tall order and so I know a lot of profs actually rely on walkthroughs right video recordings of other people playing games but there you have sort of a difference about 
you know, the experience that you're having? Are you really, um, you know, trying to uh, understand the lived perspective of other people if you're watching somebody else play as, you know, somebody who who is a, um, differently abled or, or navigating allergies? And I think what I found that worked really well in the classroom is pen and paper, actually role playing games where students sort of are assigned sort of subject positions at the beginning of, of the class. And then you then they have to play as their 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 subject. And and so we're playing games, but we're not uh, doing it in that digital sort of context. And, and, and that's worked really well in terms of bringing everybody along with you without having to rely on on sort of all of those challenges about accessibility for the digital content. Steve, Christina. Thanks. Um, yeah, I mean, so my my perspective on this really comes from how games are used more in the K to twelve um, realm and in social studies and history classrooms. And so, the, I think what the research makes clear with respect to learning specifically, like the pros of of games for digital games for learning, is that it can really enrich and enliven. A history classroom. I mean, if, if we think about, you know, our days in history classrooms, we all think they were really boring for the most part is what you hear from students. Um, and it's all sort of textbook learning. And so there is a lot of research that shows increased you know, motivation and engagement from using games, some limited studies on like additional memory recall and problem solving skills and things like this. Um, but I think what I and I think that Steve even brought this up that earlier in his uh, introduction that one of the problems is we really confuse engagement as being sufficient for learning. And I think that that's one of the real cons around um, digital games in particular. Um, there's a lot of studies that say that learning doesn't really increase when you're talking about uh, content uh, knowledge with respect to history, for example, or around uh, disciplinary skills that you might want uh, students to acquire because they don't really have time for reflection. Instead, often games are used really fleetingly as a form of, you know, um, oh, I want to capture their attention or I want this to be entertaining for them. But then we don't actually engage in something meaningful with those games outside of the game itself or even using the game itself as a source um, to look at. So, for example, making sure that there's not this um, um, what can often happen, um, very competitive notion of using gamings that recreates what is a really colonial form of, of learning in the classroom, right? We have winners and losers. You're going to triumph. You're going to win at all costs. It doesn't even matter if it's right, wrong, factual or not, or, you know, you can just think of what happens sometimes even with debates um, when you want fierce competition. When games are used that way, you know, it's it's really problematic. So we have to think really carefully about you know, the pedagogical aims of a game, what the learning outcomes that we really want from that are. And I think this relates to what Jennifer was saying is that there is an incredible lack of professional development for K to 12 uh, educators for them to feel confident, not only with the technical side of gaming, which uh, you can always get supports from IT and things like that, perhaps if you can even have the cost and maintenance, um, uh, you know, provided for, um, but actually meaningful uh, and carefully designed uh, learning that goes along with games and how K-12 educators might be able to do that. I think that that's a real con at the moment. Um, and so that takes time, that takes energy, that takes expertise. Um, and I, I think there's a lot going on right now on educators' uh, plates and we just haven't prioritized that. So I worry about that, you know, just plopping in games without that accompanying it. I could say more on pros and cons, I think, specifically around accessibility and empathy, but I'll I'll hold off. Awesome. Uh, Steve, any thoughts on that? Sure. Yeah, no, I can pick up on, on some of those threads for sure. I, I think one way to to put some of the points is to say that games are really effective at making the strange familiar. So, you know, have you ever, you know, um, managed an entire civilization from its earliest peoples to its its crowning achievements? Have you ever, you know, 
um, put on a, a ski mask and broke it into a, a building with a gun and, and robbed uh, every all the money out of the safe? Have you ever sailed the, the high seas and managed a, a whole crew of pirates? And so they're really good at taking the strange and making it familiar to people. And that is a real strength that that um, it can't be understated. So one of the games that I use in, in my, uh, across my courses really actually is called the Uber game. This was published by the Financial Times. Um, it's a web game, so you can just put it up on a web browser. Um, and what you do is you spend a week driving an Uber. And uh, what we do as a class is that we just do majority rules. We all vote on which choice we want to make. Do we want to stay within our local area and where the fares are, are lower? Do we want to commute and miss time with our children and potentially incur the like, extra mileage and gas costs, but have bigger fares? Um, do we want to take this call from this person who doesn't seem like they might be a good uh, a good fare, be a good tipper? Um, do we want to repair that chip in the in the window that we got before it becomes a big problem or or not? And so we play through that as a group. We're making the the strange. So if you haven't worked in the gig economy, it's making that strange familiar for you. Um, and then you, you get to the end and, and we go, okay, we made all the right choices. We played this as gamers play this game where we were min-maxing all of our decisions. We're making the best choices and we get to the end and we made less than minimum wage. And that that moment, it can't, it's really effective for, for learners because they we get this idea that the social games that we play are, are fair and that they're balanced. And then you go through something that is, this is based on, on um, reporting done by the Financial Times reporters and, and backed up by their research. And it, yeah, if you make all the right choices, you still don't come out ahead in these games. Um, but I think the, the to speak to some of what Christina was saying and Jen was saying was, as educators, it's also important for us to, to make the uh, familiar strange again. So I think through components like critical play and critical game design, that critical element is, is important. It helps make the familiar strange again. So, you know, um, you play a game where you go onto the land and you carve out the land and you build upon it and you claim the resources for your own and you displace the people who are there. And the win condition is whoever gets to control the most land and have displaced the most people. I'm describing, you know, Settlers of Catan, for instance, this, this is essentially the play model there. Um, that becomes really familiar to players. Players don't question that. Learners don't question that. Social citizens, settlers um, themselves don't question that. And it's incumbent upon us to, to make that familiar strange again. Like, why is this the reigning logic of this? Why is any one individual group controlling the resources or the land and, and creating, creating ownership over that? And why are the relationships always hostile? Diplomacy is actually, in most games, built out of it by design because the paradigm that reigns supreme is that competition is what drives play instead of cooperation. And so making that familiar strange again as designers, as learners, is a really useful way to take what games do well and then spin it around. And if you have the time as an educator, have them remake the game that you just had them demake. Make a, um, there's an artist out of Toronto called Gobu Amani, and she made, um, it's called Unsettling Catan. And it's all about an expansion pack you can play with your vanilla version of Catan and unmake it and demake it and decolonize it as you play it and remove some of those colonialist metaphors that are essentially undergirding the gameplay and then have them play it again and see how the outcomes shift and how the, the thinking and the attitudes shift. And it's a really, they're really powerful tools, but we need a lot more support around them. They're really difficult to deploy. Um, they're hard to scale. You know, one board game can do maybe six people. And, and once you're out beyond that, if you got a class of 30, you're going to need five copies of them. And then the cost is going up. The management, it's just, it, there's a lot of work to be done, but I think there's just so much potential there. And so that's why uh, I kind of channeled the language of Eric Zimmerman, who, who kind of playfully about 10 years ago suggested that, that we're entering the, the ludic century, the uh, 100 years defined by play. And he was pretty resoundingly uh, critiqued for, for his kind of utopian view of that. But I think there's a lot of potential there that, that um, really just ties into the idea that play and learning are very fundamentally the same activity, cognitively speaking. And so we're all kind of invested in, in play. And, and maybe there's better ways and other ways that we can integrate things than just, you know, um, having having students play the, the same kind of computer game, um, uh, the Oregon Trail type of experience, which we've now kind of complicated and, and, and moved beyond, but 
on a practical level, I think we have a long way left to go as well as, as Christina was saying. Um, yes, they're hard to deploy. I feel like that's actually a good transition to my next question because I uh, wanted to ask Christina about uh, door um, specifically. So thinking about uh, historical games, um, I think doors is particularly interesting because we have so many examples of of historical games, but it's usually within this frame of, of the simulation um, or it is, you know, we have a fictional game that's trying to create something else. Uh, entirely. So door is neither fiction or simulation. It's it's sort of closer to an interactive documentary where the voices of those who were affected are, are, are prioritized. And I'm just wondering if you can talk a little bit about how that framing came about um, in, in the development process. For sure. I, you know, I'd like to start by just acknowledging that, you know, I, I am the director of the project, but the project is you know, a really community driven collaboration. So it was really driven by the three storytellers in particular who are the form, former residents, Tony Smith, Tracy Dorrington Skinner and Gerald Morrison. But it's also um, was uh, created. And again, this was, um, you know, a, a full scale collaborative effort from a lot of um, interdisciplinary um, perspectives. Um, but people at the GI, for example, uh, Gerald Voorhees, um, Leonard Knack uh, were collaborators, and it was really the VR design was led by Jennifer Robert Smith. But also we have a card game that's part of the curriculum as well, which we often don't get as much attention for. People are really excited about the VR aspect, but the card game is actually incredibly engaging and important around um, timelines and cause and consequence around systemic racism within the African Nova Scotian uh, community and history. So um, that shout out goes to Lindsay Gibson. Um, and a lot of the reflections we've had are, are some work we've just uh, recently published that was led by uh, Lindsay Gibson around games. So I just wanted to say that about the project and, and many, many other people as well uh, who I haven't mentioned. But I think the, the really the important part, point about door and games is that the, the, the pedagogical aims that were driven by the community are what led the design. It was not the other way around. Like, let's let's ju just use VR. Hey, that sounds great. Um, instead, it really was the fact that um, we knew that we wanted to provide an experience in which students could witness the stories of the former residents within the sense of place. And so VR provided that um, ability to do that. That otherwise, and this gets into an accessibility issue, and I think Steve talked about it as well, that others otherwise would not have been available. You know, the former residents cannot go and tell their stories to every student. Um, and every student cannot go to the Nova Scotia home, even if it's it is still standing, but it's 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 been uh, reconstructed in different ways. And so um, th this is why we used VR. And the point of it was to promote um, restorative justice, specifically relationality um, towards um, uh, better race relations going forward, as well as historical thinking, ways in which we could raise students' historical consciousness so they so they really understand how they're making sense of the past um, and, and how the past lives on today. So these were really the aims of of the VR design. And so that drove everything that we we did. And so a term that Jennifer Robert Smith and others on the project really helped us think through was um, that we were we were focused on relational presence in how we designed the game. And so what that required was that we weren't looking for realism. We often think that games are most impactful and engaging when they are really focused on realism and then they'll be most, you know, um, uh, that's when students will respond uh, most effectively. Now, well, in this case, um, realism could actually be trauma provoking. Um, and we didn't, we obviously didn't want to do that. Instead, what we wanted to do was provide uh, an impressionistic aesthetic uh, to the game. So um, this was done to purposefully allow students to know that this was a constructed historical narrative based on the storyteller's memories. And that's uh, something that's really important because 
we want students to start thinking historically about different forms of evidence, including oral history. And they, they, the, the VR propels them to do that even outside of the game. So it's treated like the game itself is treated like a source, a historical source that they should be thinking about um, critically and analyzing and assessing. And so it provides that means to do that. The other thing that's very unlike most uh, virtual environments is that there's really limited interactivity. You know, the whole point of a game is often this high interactivity among players. Um, and we don't do that. We really focus on what we call a pedagogy of listening um, and being witnesses in listening to the story. Sound is really important in, in the game or in the VR. There's no avatars um, that the storytellers um, assume they are fully embodied as themselves, which is very, very important. Um, and there's also, uh, especially given the topic, we aren't asking for students to assume any kind of character role. They are themselves. They are experiencing this in their own uh, real world perspectives. Um, and uh, that, that was really important as well because um, it is about uh, a compelling a certain aspect of listening. They do get to pick stories. They then share because they listen to different stories. What stories did you experience? Um, what what did you see? Um, but this is making connections between the virtual world and the real world, but also between past and present through this experience. So that is why um, we want them to be able to take action and have historical agency outside that that's sort of propelled outside of the VR. Um, and then I'd say the other thing that was really required for this. Um, idea of relational presence that we wanted to design was that it it actually is purposefully sort of incomplete. So the game or the the VR experience is really um, not meant to provide the kind of flow and full immersion that you would think of that you want for most games, but rather to compel what we refer to as affective dissonance, this uh, like level of discomfort that. Um, it propels you to want to do otherwise no more. And, and that's where, again, these really structured lessons, we have five lessons in total that happen outside of the VR. The VR really had students, and we, we did pilot it with two classes, to say, how did this happen? How did, why didn't I know about this before now? How, how have I not known this story? And what can I do? Like, what responsibility do I bear now that I've heard these stories? And so that sort of propels them then outside of uh, the VR to explore that further through other sources. Um, and also we have a restorative action. We actually allow them to say, okay, now, now what can I do with this knowledge and do a group project towards a, a restorative end? So as far as DOOR is um, sort of an, an example of how this might happen, um, you know, I, I'll go back to some of the cons. It's labor intensive. It requires a lot of consultation if you're going to do this um, meaningfully, ethically, and with community. Um, and we were lucky to have those resources um, from Shirk. But two of the things that I'd say are very positive. We avoided um, technological determinism. In no way did we allow the VR entertainment aspect to take over what um, we really thought was necessary storytelling uh, for community justice. And then the other aspect I'd say is that, again, it was led um, by a pedagogical purpose, right? We, and we knew up front what that pedagogical purpose was. And so all of the design was really about sharing these silenced histories um, and building relational connections that were intergenerational and intercultural. Um, so, I, I, you know, I again, for me, it was not games for games sake, although I have learned so much through the project, but also continue to learn by being a member of the GI community. Um, but knowing that we need to be cautious about at all times, if we're going to be focused on um, equity, diversity and inclusion and games for social justice about what that requires. Thanks so much, Christina. Um, so I, I want to stick on the topic of, of games in the classroom. Um, but I want to think about, uh, you know, classrooms in which games are not just uh, a tool, but the focus of the class. Um, so, Steve, you have experience teaching game design development, but also game studies. So for those in the audience who maybe don't understand, um, could you sort of explain the difference between those two and maybe talk about some of your um, how your strategies change when teaching those uh, two different things? Yeah, absolutely. I, that's, uh... It's a good question. Um, I think I think it would be a mistake to draw too hard of a line between the two of them. I think to understand 
And to study a game is also to engage with how it's designed, who it's designed by, the purpose that it's designed for, those types of questions. Um, and and uh, unpacking those and factoring those into how you understand the game. But um, to speak a little more personally, you know, I come from um, you know a background that that views um, play is is really just a, a form of um, you know interpretation and, and sense making and understanding um, and making meaning. Really, um, you know, Salen and Zimmerman refer to game design as as cognitive interactivity. Um, it's it's or, or interpretive participation. Those are those two terms that they use, and that very much is what um, games is about. It's that they're about making meaning. You know, you could take something like a little metal dog and a little plastic red thing, and all of a sudden that's your token, and that's a house that you now own that you're renting out as you're playing Monopoly, and they have all sorts of meaning and, and intensity and, and emotional attachment to them just by being situated within that game itself. And so I view game studies as, as looking really at the, the way that games make meaning in, in various ways, shapes, and form, not just within the game itself, but socially and culturally. You know, building on the Monopoly example, the Monopoly famously, as most people are aware, is based on a game called the Landlord's Game, which was a deep and thorough criticism of monopolies and monopolistic ownership of land and why why land falls into private hands when no those private individuals did not create that land and not create that resource um the landlord's game has two modes in it one is the the, the monopolist mode which the author of the the game lizzie mcgee said you know this um this game is going to be really frustrating and boring for players because it's essentially rigged against you and it's going to push other players out and they're going to see and be outraged in her mind at how unfair the game is and then they're going to play this other mode which um, is called the georges mode it's based on henry george's belief in a kind of collective shared taxation um, and then they play this game where you know when you pay rent it doesn't go into private hands it goes into a public pool and that as that pool builds up, when you pass go, you actually collect more and more wages as you go around the board. You That money gets spent to nationalize the transportation and electricity spaces on the board. Um, it converts the private property go to jail space into a public college that you then get a degree on when you land on it. Um, so it's all like studying that um, as a scholar and looking at it um, and understanding it is about getting at the meaning of those systems at society, at our role and agency within society, um, our, our maybe our responsibility to question that role and to question um, how society is established and, and abiding by the roles we that are ascribed to us. And I think that gets at what Mary Flanagan calls critical play, which is really deconstructing the process of playing a game, understanding the meanings it's trying to convey to you, the roles and agency it's trying to ascribe to you, um, and questioning it, pushing it, challenging it, deconstructing it as you play it. And I think that that is, is where game studies really hits its, its peak. And if you uh, follow things like Pierre Bourdieu, um, a French theorist, he's strongly of the belief that, that life is essentially a game and that life is made up of social games. And if you can play something like the landlord's game or Monopoly critically, then why can't you play the current monopolies that are unfolding in our society now in that same critical vein and basically arrive at the same conclusions. These are unfair games. They are not in our favor. And they we can't simply change what we do as individual players. We have to, at some level, change the rules of the game by which they're played. Um, that leads into game design, which I think um, I think if you teach game studies particularly well, that you energize people to want to make changes to rules, to systems, um, to their own sense of agency and the agency of others. And then game design is really harnessing that ambition back into games themselves to design games that do the unconventional, that, that push beyond what simply replicating the existing design paradigms and practices and and boy is our, our entire field just obsessed with violence and and the the mechanics of violence and the and it, it's it's trapped by that logic and there's just a whole a whole new world really out, out there waiting for for game designers to move beyond those paradigms and to think beyond them and we can't get there if we can't play games critically and so i see those two things as very much being um, wedded to one another. And, and for me, game design is going again through those cycles of 
critical play into critical design back into critical play. But I think game studies does something similar and that it just prepares the, the designers as social citizens in different capacities and in different aspects of their lives that I think by no means is, is limited to just games themselves. Thanks, Steve. That's a great answer. I, I, I have a question for Jen next. It's specifically about game design and development programs, but I almost feel like I have to point out that um, the program that Steve uh, teaches in, that I have taught in as well, you know, is a very uh, unique uh, program when it comes to these game design and development uh, uh, programs at large. Um, uh, programs that are uh, so focused on um, teaching, you know, like critical play as a design method. Um, you know, it's becoming more and more common, but it is not the most common thing, obviously. Um, so before I transition to Jen's question, I just wanted to say that so people weren't like, oh, but it sounds like game design and development is amazing and great and fantastic. Uh, what, what, what could you possibly be critiquing? Um, anyway, so yeah, just moving into that, um, thinking about game design development students specifically, um, uh, Jen talked at the beginning about a project that she's working on with other uh, educators looking at and assessing all these different sort of game design development um, programs. Um, so based on the data that your team's collected, uh, are educators, I guess, effectively preparing students to find roles in the games industry? No. <laughs> uh, there, there, there's a lot to be said there. And I think there's probably, I think five key points that we're finding so far uh, that I'll talk about, um, but much, much more to say because we're just in the first year of the study and, you know, just through 70 interviews and, and sort of starting the tertiary coding of, of those. I mean, people who are familiar with the game industry and who work in the game industry and study the game industry um, know that the game industry is actually looks like this beautiful fun place to work um but is actually really really exploitative and inaccessible to many people um and that the that the only types there are very limited amount of people who can make that work for them more than a few years um and those people are generally geographically mobile who don't have caregiving uh, responsibilities like families at home or even dogs or pets um, because they have to work such long hours, um, who live in, in specific uh, geographic hubs uh, because they move from studio to studio to studio quite often, um, according to when games are finished and, and, and launched and everybody is um, downsized. Um, and they're mostly white, young, and, and male. And, and so this is what we know about the game industry and the working conditions in there. Um, but you wouldn't know that if you were looking at university programs that are advertising um, their game development programs. And we know that in the past few years, the number of programs associated with game design and development degrees in, in Canada and the United States have exploded. There are, I think, more than 600 programs, right? So th this is massive. And so there's a disconnect um, between the larger discourse of the industry, right? It's growth, it's bringing in so much GDP, it's more financially lucrative than um, the films, film industry and music industry combined. So there's a, a disconnect between that, that sort of discourse, which the university administration are talking about, and the realities of the job market. Um, and, and so many universities and colleges are launching programs, advertising careers, that actually aren't there for the students once they graduate, especially in design and development streams. Um, and, and, and so I, I, I know it, it's really, really difficult, but I think that games educators need to re resist building programs that can't fulfill the marketing promises. And so if your program is linked to a career at the end in the game industry, I think you need to think seriously about whether you can fulfill those promises and actually track where where what where your alumni are going and, and then um, change your sort of um, admission accordingly. Um, the, 
So that was the first sort of issue. The second issue that we're seeing is that there is this idea that the way that you get into the game industry is just make games. And so every game design and development program sort of ends in this capstone where the students work in groups and they finish a complete game and ideally they launch it on the app store or something. And that game goes on their portfolio and that portfolio is what they send to game companies to get them a job. That's how you learn um, and that's how, how, how you how you gain employment. And so curriculums are focusing on, on projects and shipping a game um, as the end goal, as the graded component. Um, and, and so, but what we're seeing, and this sort of bears out with other sort of researchers that I'm involved with, is that the game is complete, but it's also often hacked, it's rushed, it's uninspired, right? Because students prioritize putting the finished stuff on their, uh, their portfolios, um, and they emphasize the product, not the process, um, because it's this object that's perceived as essential to uh, earning a job. And so they don't take the time to sort of iterate or prototype or, or sort of critically reflect on what they're making in the ways that Steve is illustrating that their program does. Um, and, and so they just go in with an idea of what their game should look like from the start. And all the way through the project, they don't sort of um, revise those ideas. And, and, and so this, this is an interesting problem for educators to work out because is we might have to seriously question, is the focus on finished class game on portfolio capstone sort of thing a dead end, right? Is a game shipping capstone model a good model? Is it actually helping anybody get what they actually need to get into the industry, right? Is this what's going to help you secure a job? Um, and, and this isn't to say that these capstones where you're building games um, as a team are, are in don't have merit, I think they're great for some things. They're great for project management. Um, they're great for uh, developing collaboration skills and communication skills um, and soft skills. But the actual product that's created and even perhaps the game design skills themselves in, in critical design that Steve is talking about, I don't think that, that that that's being emphasized and that's problematic. And we know from sort of on the flip side, from my collaborators, especially Sean Googlis, is doing interviews with people who are hiring for game studios um, and HR personnel. They're, they're actually hiring people who don't have game design and de development degrees. They're, they're more likely to hire people from outside that stream than inside this stream. Uh, and, and I think that that might be actually be related to that issue there. Yeah, um, and I, oh, sorry. I can keep on going, but you can, you can pop it. I have, I have something to just say specifically about that. And then maybe you can pull back in with, with the, yeah. is that I think that um, exactly what you're seeing is that we see a lot of these programs that are teaching students this, the same sort of breadth or kit of skills to, you know, work in games. But in reality, like every single job in games is, is different and requires a completely different set of highly specialized skills. And, you know, we've seen a lot of people from the GI move on into the games industry. And, you know, usually it's not that they have this general game making ability. It's that they have some very specific uh, specialized skill that they've developed during, you know, their time in grad school or something like that, um, which is, you know, not necessarily the same thing you're going to get from a, a generalized games degree. And, I think most people who I know in the games industry, and I know a lot, do not have a degree in game design and development. So I guess in your opinion, based on the data you guys have seen, is is there an issue with you know specialization versus generalization? Are are these students getting a, like a general breadth of skill, but they don't have one specific thing that that is their area? Or I, I think we have to wait until more to hear what the data tells us, right, about their first years in. And we'll ask them, you know, did your degree, did the did the classes that you think helped you the most actually help you? And what skills are you actually leveraging to, to sort of um, move forward in your careers? But I, I do think there's a little bit of a bait and switch happening here that, that the, the game development and design degrees actually aren't, they're teaching many skills, but most of those skills actually aren't the ones that are, are going to be useful in getting those, those coveted or the, the jobs that students think they covet. 
Um, but what we're finding also is that many of the conditions in education, especially that crunch and overwork periods uh, of, you know, 60, 70 hour weeks, they're mirroring that at, of the industry. And this perhaps comes as no surprise. Um, but students and maybe even the instructors see um, these programs as basically a crucible that filters out those who can't make it and perhaps those who do by sort of mirroring the conditions that they're expecting to find in the industry themselves, right? And, and so this sort of creates this path dependency, right? Students have this determination to work in games and nothing that they encounter suggests that that they should do otherwise and, and nothing that they see or hear about the actual conditions in the industry is, is dissuading them. And it's basically they see making it through these conditions um, is, is that they will be seen and recognized because of their dedication, right? Despite the shittiness, right? This is how I display passion um, for the work or the careers that I want is that I'm willing to put up with this, these sort of working conditions. Um, and, and some of this is linked to their mentality as gamers themselves, right? Playing games has trained them in some sense to grind, right? To, to have this survival mode. Um, and, and so this analytical approach that they're approaching school as gaming has trained them um, to to mirror these sort of same sensibilities. Um, and, and so we think that maybe they're they're substituting the journey for the destination, right? The grinding for what are you actually grinding for and what happens after you complete this game or or this level or this degree. Um, and, and you know, we found that students aren't naive, right? They they know the state of the game industry. They have uh, actually really, really low expectations for the salaries that they could expect and how long it's actually going to take them to get those salaries. They're they're thinking like $40,000 a year when at some of these American institutions, they're paying up to $100,000 a year for tuition. Um, and, and, and so they, 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 they know that the, the types of conditions that they're going to see. But Ironically, and they know which studios actually are, or they identify studios that are bad places to work, but this debt ratio means that they'd all, without a, without exception, they all said that they would take jobs at studios that they identify as bad places to work. Um, and, and so this is this is really, really um, concerning. And, and, and perhaps this is linked to the fact that issues in the game industry, you know, crunch, um, unionization, uh, discrimination are very rarely formally dealt with in the curriculums themselves, um, and with some notable exceptions, but very few. And it's mostly dealt with these sort of whisper networks off the table by in, in individual professors uh, and discussions in student groups. Um, so students actually have an awareness of what some of these key issues are, um, not a lot about unionization, but they have no tools to address it, especially from a, a position that lacks structural power, right? If you are a new hire um, or an intern with a debt load, you're finally getting in the door in the industry and you're witnessing harassment or facing social pressure to work on weekends, you actually have no tools or, or your, ed your education has equipped you with no tools to respond. You can just identify the problem, but not how to move forward from, from your position. And so those tools for, for sort of people who lack structural power is actually what I think educators need to start uh, integrating into the curriculum if they're prepping students to work in the game industry, but also tech industry more generally or, or everywhere, because I think a lot of these these issues are, are not limited to to game design and development, but are actually much, much more widespread. Yeah, absolutely. And I feel like in recent months, especially with the recession, we can see how the the games industry and the tech industry, you know, overlapping that they seem to be coming up against a lot of the same issues. So um, I have tons more questions, obviously, but in this last half hour, I did want to uh, open it up to some audience questions. Um, so I'm just going to see if there's anyone in the in-person audience who has any questions first, and then I'll open it up to the online audience for those of you who are online. So, yeah, yeah. Yeah, um, I was so curious about, because I'm not so educated on the games like field, like as careers, but for students and for young people, since it seems to be overwhelmed with young white men, and they're like expecting conditions to be poor. Do you see any solidarity with other fields or do you see um, some of that kind of isolation? I come from like a social work background and this sounds so familiar to me from my social work peers as students, as workers, 
Um, and I have some friends who are in STEM and they have that too. And I'm always trying to bridge that gap between STEM and humanities. And I'm always wondering, um, are they feeling like that solidarity too? Or, or are you finding in your experience that people are still feeling pretty siloed? That's a very interesting question. Did you guys hear that okay? Yeah, um, and I think it's it's especially interesting because in the games industry, we do see you know people needing these skills across the board, some more STEM focused skills, some more humanities focused skills, all you know in the same studios or something. Do do any of you want to address that specifically, Jen? I, I, I think there are silos within game design and development itself, right? And, and Emma sort of alludes to this in that there are hierarchies of value and hierarchies of worth in the terms of in terms of the skill sets and the roles in, in a game studio. And so work that is is sort of uh, gendered as feminine, um, human resources, project management, marketing, um, artwork, this is devalued um, and, and underpaid. Um, workers who are racialized or, or gendered, they are also um, experiencing sort of these, these gender wage gaps. Um, and, and so we we see that within the studios, there, there's, there, there's the silos themselves where, where many sort of people in these more well-paid, stable work, work uh, rather than contract work or freelance work or independent work, um, don't really experience the same set of concerns as, as people sitting right at the desk right beside them. Um, and I know sort of Emma has intimate experiences with this where some, some workers at the same studio um, who are working remote will be doing the same role and one person in Canada may be making $60,000 a year or $80,000 a year. Um, and their senior um, working outside of Canada is making under $20,000 a year, right? Um, and, and so we definitely, definitely see silos I think the increasing knowledge and, and sort of agitation towards unionization um, and unionization um, and looking at other tech industries um, and, and success and sort of Amazon and, and things like that, um, even Starbucks, is sort of trying to create that solidarity that's there. Um, but people honestly are just trying to keep their heads down, I, I think, for a lot, a, a large part. Yeah, I, I think that it's interesting how, you know, like one of the bodies that's been intervening in the games industry is the Canadian Communications Association, um, you know, and that not being like a immediately, you know, STEM focused uh, um, group or whatever. So there is definitely, I think that there is that sort of solidarity where, um, you know, that's going to be necessary uh, for any sort of union in, in games to form and, and yeah, sorry, Jim. Yeah, no, 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 don't don't apologize. Um, I, I, I think that that actually brings up a good issue is that there's there are the STEM acknowledgement sort of of uh, uh, this is what actually game industry um, administrators and CEOs and execs sort of point to when they see sort of the gender wage gap or, or the lack of women or racialized uh, people working in games is they point to STEM and say the reason that we have this problem with en not enough women in our studios is because STEM education is failing and there aren't enough women in computer science programs. And so they basically pass the buck and, and sort of blame this leaky pipeline is a, of not, not enough girls playing games or not enough girls in math programs or not enough girls learning to code. Um, and, and sort of a ignore the fact that um, game development is not just coding, is not just computer science, and, and ignore the fact that once women and girls actually enter the industry, they leave it really, really quickly. And who would want to enter um, such a toxic working condition? Um, so they're basically turning to STEM sort of knowledge to pass the buck instead of cleaning up their own house. Yeah. Um, and also, I was before I go to Christina when I said communications association, I meant communication workers of America. I that was like a pregnancy brain moment there, uh, Christina. Yeah, I mean, uh, I, uh, this um, topic really resonates for what happens in K to twelve as well. So right now, the big push is you know girls can code. The big push in K to twelve is um, you know get 
young girls into STEM. And we aren't honest then about what the conditions are for them uh, when that happens or what the you know realistic conditions will be um, when when they um, come into the University of Waterloo or when they go into uh, an industry position. Um, but we're so focused on those kind of career skills. Um, it's really taken away, I think, about what games can do in K-12. So everything that Steve has been talking about with respect to critical play and social change and learning about systems and processes so then you can change the rules of the game, um, which is so important for any kind of justice-centered education we need for young people to become uh, social citizens and justice-oriented citizens um, is really missing. And what's happened is instead, we have really focused on that um, education side that, that Jennifer's talking about where we're focused on career skills, get them coding. It's this very career neoliberal oriented notion of get a job. And so every potential of what games could offer is sort of being um, it, it really taken taken over and and we're 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 missing all of the the potentiality I think of that and all the different ways um, that we could really engage with critical play. So I think that's happening. Just to add to what Jennifer's saying, really from the the, the K to twelve, um, and and then exacerbated as we go on uh, into game studies. So it'd be wonderful to see ways in which we could support a different way of introducing games in a more wholesale way um, and critical way within the K-12 sector. And by the way, if you haven't seen Mythic Quest, has anyone seen the show on Apple TV? Yeah. It's just, it, 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 I mean, I was laughing because everything Jennifer just said about girls can code and getting them um, into the industry. All that happened in a recent episode was that the girls showed up and they tried to find the couple of women who were there. Uh, <laughs> and then the women were like, don't do this. Just whatever you do, run. Um, this really honest appraisal of it. So everything you were saying is sort of um, that kind of critical appraisal on its own industry. Interesting. Um, Steve, I'm sure you have some thoughts on this too, but I just want to make sure, is there anyone in the uh, online audience who has any questions? Um, you could turn on your camera to ask or you could put it in the chat and I could read it out. Uh, it's up to you. Maybe I'll let people think on think on that uh, for a second. Maybe uh, if you want to ask a question, maybe put put your name in the chat and I can I can call on you. Um, but uh, I guess while well, we're waiting on that, uh, Steve, do you, do you have any thoughts on that about the sort of uh, STEM humanities divide and the solidarity issue? Yeah, I think oh, I have lots of thoughts. Um, I've grappled endlessly basically with the question, you know, of I, I'm, I keenly observe, you know, how normative essentially each cohort of our program is. I'm keenly interested in and addressing, um, you know, when when your cohort doesn't look like the population at large, you've got some questions to ask. You need to interrogate that, absolutely. But then it just it feels like you're giving, you know, you're encouraging people to get in line for something that's a, a gauntlet at the end of that line. And it's just like, why am I why am I hurting people into a pipeline that is there to just grind them up and spit them out? That that's that that is the most neoliberal definition of equity diversity and inclusion that you can think of is that it's just the optics of it are, are what they're interested in addressing not the exploitation not the overwork not the harassment not the discrimination it is the the perception of progress that motivates these decisions and and um i think academic programs in particular really game design development programs are particularly um, in a difficult position because generally university programs don't point themselves directly at specific industries and specific jobs. We are that is more the purview of a college program. University programs tend to be a little bit more flexible and dynamic in the skill sets that they're providing. And so they're venturing out into newer territory that you know, a lot of faculty haven't really been trained to teach people for specific <laughs> industry positions. And the idea of a four year BA or, or BFAA um, that focuses on specific jobs is is almost to a degree antithetical to it's what the institution was founded to do. And so we're being asked to do things that we weren't typically asked to do. And we're sending 
students or graduates into into an industry that is that is uh, all all sorts of different kind of equity and, and um, uh, issues. And then games themselves, especially, well, I, I was gonna say, especially digital games, but board games has its own challenges, but um, digital games is just, it's the overlap of techno utopianism, techno determinism. It's the overlap of, um, uh, of exploitation of, of tech workers and difficult to quantify labor. Um, and then it's also, um, you know, the, uh, as games become more financially lucrative than other industries, it's capturing the interests of people that have exploited those industries and are looking for new pastures to exploit themselves. You know, uh, the new Call of Duty that came out two weeks ago made $800 million its opening weekend, which was the culmination of the two highest grossing films of the year combined. Um, over a three-day window, um, and Activision Blizzard is just rife with accusations of, of worker mistreatment, exploitation, gender discrimination, just all sorts of, of very troubling behavior, and you get first-year students, women, and the, they're coming to our program saying, I, I want to go work on Overwatch. I want to work on, on these games that I grew up playing, and, and it, what a challenging conversation to have with someone and to to not have good answers you know uh you know the point was brought up earlier you know preparing students to have those difficult conversations and strategies for how to deal with the, not having structural agency is that not the modern condition kind of writ large right is that we have a lot of um theories and and uh, idealistic plans for how to resolve these things but translating those to someone who has no ability to actually enact those plans is incredibly difficult um i run a, a role play exercise where i take um popular ethical issues this is my ethics for game designers class and i um so things like you know somebody lifting uh, uh a design of a game from another studio and trying to make their own iteration of it. And then I assign students different roles on that team. They all have a hidden goal um, that they need to achieve through a conversation and they role play this out. You know, one person's the publisher and they only care about the money that they're gonna make from this lifted idea. Another one's the lead designer and they pride themselves on being unique in their designs. And so they're not gonna move ahead at all with anything that resembles this game they're lifting the idea from. And then you have uh, different perspectives. And so they, they play it out and they, we try to get the, those applied components to them uh, and that applied experience. But I think ultimately what you're left with is just recognizing how little agency we have and how systemic and structural these problems are. And it almost always comes down to, to money. You know, there's just so little funding um, to get games off the ground that you're willing to, to bend and break your morals and your ethics to get the job, to get paid, to, to be in an industry you want to be in. And, um, you know, Jen was saying earlier, you know, you have um, you know, students are recognizing that the leading companies in our in our industry are deeply exploitative of their laborers, and yet they still would say they would take a job there. That 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 says it all, really, is that there's there's uh, they're they're keenly interested in, in participating in this the lar one of the largest cultural um, industries in the world, but they they we our expectations have been so worn down. Um, and, and the world itself has a lot, of, a lot of people down in that respect that, that they're willing to accept those, those unacceptable conditions simply to, to be part of this, to be part of the world of play and of games, yeah. Absolutely, you, you covered a lot there, so. I'm sorry. If I, I won't add it. anything, no, no, okay. Um, so James from the audience had a question. Um, James, are, are you ready to ask your question now? Yep, sure am, thanks very much. Um, Hi, Christine and Jennifer. Nice to hear from you and hear what you're up to. It's so interesting. And uh, But my question is more directed at Steve, although I think you can all answer it. Um, Steve, when you were speaking earlier in the in the, the webinar, you you mentioned how you mentioned a, a game, the Uber game, I think it was, and, you, and how you how you liked using that because it allowed students to kind of imagine, you know, what it would be like to be an uber driver and then you gave other examples the pirates game where they can imagine what it's like to be a pirate or all of those things um and you know when when we teach like literature or film we we often say the same thing to students you know this is through literature and film that you can imagine you can you can you can live through experiences you know and that goes back of course i'm sure you know through the even theories of what literature is you know back to aristotle and what have you so that's not uncommon so what I'm curious about is, well, then is there a, is there somehow a, 
a kind of a qualitative difference between the that kind of um, imagining oneself in the situation of another in in the games world as as compared to the 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 world of literature and film. Yeah, I I just wrote an eight thousand word article <laughs> on that that I sent <laughs> off to a journal last week on that exact topic. It is very uh, near and dear to my heart in terms of understanding that I I having come up through um, my PhD where we were just kind of coming out of a lot of techno utopian discourse of the '90s and a lot of rah 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 VR games. All these are all going to change everything. We're all going to be playing games and and trying to build essentially an argument that, that other forms of art had been somewhat obsolesced by the rise of games and interactivity. I, I'm very critical of those, those perspectives and views. I, I, I take the, a more of a Big Ten approach, and that's why I tend to like think people like Bourdieu, who talks about this idea of like our, our habitus, our, our socially ingrained habits for how we perceive, think about, and interact with the world that are shaped and conditioned through our upbringing, through our class, our gender, our race, um, other aspects of our identities throughout our lives, and that they are tested and put into play when we engage with art. And that's putting up those those um, habits for for testing and for revising and putting against the experience of a character in a novel or somebody um, uh, characters in a play or um, you know even listening to the lyrics uh, of music and, and letting those the, that that you know what's called rhetorical listening well being open to being persuaded by the worldviews of others it transcends games and it's essentially part of all kinds of cognitive interact interaction that happens in, in all forms of interpretation, whether that's literature, music, film, games. Where I think games are, are uniquely positioned, though, would be around agency, essentially. Um, games allow you to express agency and to learn new forms of agency. So there's a difference between watching characters make good or bad choices and seeing the consequences play out and then making those choices for yourself. So um, a, a common uh, popular um, kind of line um, in, in game studies along this uh, topic is um, games are one of the few media forms of media that we have that can make us feel guilty. Um, we can watch characters make choices and the characters feel guilty, but until we make those choices ourselves, until we um, you know, make a decision that lets a, our, a loved one down within the game or until we, um, you know, rush out to capture the flag and get gunned down because, uh, and all our teammates were, were hoping to charge as a group, but now we feel guilty because we were impetuous. And all those, there's different red, emotional registers that games can tap into because they have that sense of agency and allow players to explore that agency. Um, and then for me in particular, where that becomes really interesting is that you look at something called like, uh, what you might call it interpretive agency or the the uh, bounded way in which we interpret things um, based on our situation. So um, in, in a lot of games, a lot of multiplayer games, there's players have the role of a tank and a healer and a, and a, a damage dealer. And, and players learn to interpret their the play space in terms of their role within that dynamic. And they they see different things based on the agency that they have. They're interpreting things in different ways. And I think that if we can translate that interpretive agency and that sense of interpretive agency that's keyed to our different social locations, that really opens up a lot more possibilities for intersubjectivity, for, for social cognition, for understanding how other people understand the world. But I would see that as part of a much larger media ecology that is saturated with the stories and narratives of, of essentially those who haven't had the opportunity to share their experiences and what their agency is like and how it's constrained in some ways and, and afforded in other ways. But I think agency, I guess, to answer your point, is is, is one of the key aspects of, of games and the ability to exercise it. But I, I really don't subscribe to the idea that, that there's something especially unique about games that would put it above other, other forms of, of media and, and interaction in general, yeah. Uh, thanks, Steve. Uh, do we have any other audience questions from the online or in-person audience? Emma, am I okay to add to that quickly too? Yeah, yeah, um, absolutely. 
I so first of all, really need to read that paper. So let let us know <laughs> when it's out, Steve. Um, one of the things that we struggle with in history education and specifically through games is this idea of historical empathy. And so in the case of empathy, it's not the empathy machine of VR, uh, putting yourself in the place of another person. So where I think, and it's not just VR, but in games um, where I think in addition to agency, it's that idea of embodiment. Um, and I think that it's highly problematic when we have that sense of embodiment where we take on a persona, a character, um, and that is so much more immersive when that happens within certain digital games. And so and that gets to everything that you're talking about with agency. Um, uh, but I, I think it's highly problematic in many ways, um, but ways in which it's not even digital games, but in the K-12 sector, there's often this um, embodiment simulation role playing that happens around topics that should never be part of game playing. So um, there's been lots of, you know, instances of this in the news, but games in which, you know, white students are role playing uh, games with respect to slavery um, or simulations of being a residential school survivor and having to figure out what you're going to pack um, you know, for, for being taken away from your home. I mean, really trauma inducing, um, absolutely um, horrific, I think, ways of trying to engage with difficult knowledge about the past. Um, so that kind of simulation and embodiment, I think, can be really um, particularly problematic when you're in the digital uh, space. Um, but what we try to look at is historical empathy instead, which is really trying to understand historical figures um, while you're still fully embodied in yourself and in the present, but trying to understand uh, what might be um, a different time, a different place, a different event, and what that kind of historical empathy might mean and how you might engage that way um, through games, which has a, a different uh, form of of, of understanding and perspective taking, which is so important for uh, historical understanding. Absolutely. Uh, we have another uh, in-person audience question here. Yeah, no, uh, me again, I'm sorry. <laughs> I was just, um, Christina had mentioned something and then it got me thinking, oh my gosh, about my education as a, in K through 12. Um, and then even recently in my master's education in social work, um, that residential example, uh, we had an assignment where that was one of the was to write um, a letter to a loved one uh, from the perspective of being like a child in a residential school. And um, obviously this is a terrible assignment. We were very disturbed by it. And um, many of the students actually petitioned the program to say like, this isn't an acceptable assignment. How did this get into the syllabus? Um, there are like women in the classroom. It was mostly women who had family members who had survived residential schools. I have a friend whose grandmother survived a residential school. Uh, so they had big troubles with this. And so I was wondering, and thankfully our program was very receptive and they did challenge that. They struck it from the syllabus and they changed the assignment. Uh, and that professor was spoken to and dealt with, I think, uh, privately in that way. But I just was wondering from the perspective of, like as educators in an academic setting, are you seeing this commonly currently um, among your peers or hearing it from your students that they're seeing these things happening currently and uh, what your institutions are doing? That's a little sensitive maybe because I'm a UW alumna, but um, I, I have many criticisms of the administration at times, but um, even the positive stuff, if you're seeing positive change. Yeah, just, I don't know, Christina, if you want to address that directly or um, I would just say in the K to 12 sector, we're still having um, story after story of that kind of use of um, games as perhaps unreflexive ways of providing a topic as entertaining or thinking that you're doing no harm by uh, invoking a game of role play or simulation um, and also getting you know, back to the idea of, of, of really focusing on sort of a, a, a violent consumption and competitive approach to how we learn. Um, this is why we marginalize a lot of learners um, and we push them out of schools. We have a model 
um, that actually values uh, competition above collaboration. We don't uh, value experiential learning um, as we say we do. Um, and when, when we do that, we aren't thinking of the ways that we can do no further harm, which should be a basic principle of how we um, engage in any kind of learning activity. Um, so uh, there are lots, unfortunately, K-12 sector is rife with examples of how this continues to happen and how the actual approach to learning continues to be um, harmful for a lot of students. So, you know, I'd be a huge advocate for, for using games for, for, you know, for critical play, as Steve is saying, and towards um, a means of social change um, and and you know I'm still remaining hopeful. I I, I think that before you know inst games commonly seem like a quick easy solution for engagement in these contexts, but unless you have a deep nuanced understanding of how to apply them, um, and this this sort of game studies understanding or critical play that it could commonly commonly go wrong um i think this this is sort of a parallel um issue um where i see this happening it is not necessarily in the context but in the um gamification pressures right because i think the gamify your classroom learning also sort of frames the educational experience in in terms of points um in, in terms of competition in terms of leaderboard um, and, and so that can also create sort of a dynamic that perhaps we might actually want to avoid rather than aspire to, right? Yeah, yeah absolutely. I'm sorry. Yeah, go ahead, Steve. Uh, just building on the, on the conversation too is um, you know, one of the longstanding um, challenges, I guess, that disability studies has grappled with is this idea of disability simulators, right? This idea of wearing a blindfold for an afternoon, using a wheelchair for a day, and supposedly providing that vicarious understanding, which, you know, if you know embodiment, as Christina has been mentioning, um, and, and embodied cognition, it's, 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 to us, it's doing more harm than good, because that is not fundamentally how people live their lives embodied in that way. You are an able-bodied person trying on somebody else's, you know, um, uh, habits for a day, but you're not able to actually intuit and understand that knowledge beyond that very surface level sense. So in, in empathy discourse, you know, we have, there's terms like self-oriented empathy and other-oriented empathy. So self-oriented empathy being, um, you know, we see this a lot in sports where, um, you know, uh, they ask, uh, sports players, you know, what is your um, uh, your uh, your thoughts on on, on um, you know, women's reproductive rights and and um, and pay discrimination against women? And you know, well, I just had a daughter, and you know, that's that's really changed my perspective on things. And that's self-oriented empathy. That's understanding others through some sort of connection back to yourself. And so and that's not typically what we mean when we mean by empathy or understanding. Um, and then there's other-oriented empathy, which is rooted in the lived experiences of other people um, and that embodied experience which is very different than trying on a blindfold for a day or using a wheelchair for, for a day uh, type of approach. And I, I think that um, the real challenge though is that, and this is what Christina's work is grappling with, is that there's a knowledge gap there though, where we need, socially we need to hear these stories that have been marginalized and suppressed, but we need to hear them not as people who could have experienced them, but as people that were around when they were happening or that benefited in some way, shape or form from how they've transpired, or that that could never happen to you. And what does that say about the structures of society um, to really compel us away from self-oriented empathy and to have us sit with that other oriented um, empathetic connection with other people. And um, you know, one of the games that I, studied quite heavily during my doctoral work was a, a game called Autism, which is about um, uh, auditory hypersensitivity that autistic children experience. It's a, a web game that you can play and um, the comments on it are, are fascinating because half of them are, this is the best horror game I've ever played, which is deeply derogatory and, and offensive, but also points to the limited um, depiction of autism that the game provides. And then the other half of the comment is self-identified autistic people or their, their parents saying, 
this is really useful for me to show other people what it's like when people are really sensitive to sound and why my child is really distressed because your kid just screamed in their ear, even though it was an excitement, this actually causes a deeper level of harm and, and discomfort than, than you or I could possibly imagine. And, and I think that game really shows the, 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 the problems and the solutions that are embedded within um, using games and play and, and simulation in general to, to um, engage in that historical consciousness, to engage in social cognition, um, to, to engage in that, that necessary activity um, that we, we really need, but we're not quite at a, a broader understanding of how to, how to achieve that, I think, ethically. And I think that, you know, like Christina's work in particular, I think now obviously comes to mind as exploring what that looks like and trying to grapple with the, the fundamentally embodied nature in which we learn and the fundamental limitations of our own embodied experiences and how we, how we, found, how we handle those gaps. And, and I think emphasizing the consequences of not addressing them, which is to perpetuate the way things are. But boy, do we not want to create more trauma and more harm or more reductive interpretations of what those experiences are at the same time. We're, we'd be just creating more problems that we would invent more games to solve and then it would just be an endless cycle. Yeah, yeah. Absolutely. I mean, the all fantastic answers. Um, so unfortunately, we're out of time. I feel like we could just talk about this forever. Um, but I'm just hoping that uh, our online and in-person audience will join me in a quick round of applause. I just want to thank you guys so much for joining us. This was such a really interesting conversation. Um, I, do you want to end off or is there anywhere where people can find out more about your work before we leave today? Website, Twitter, anything like that. I know Twitter is at the end of its <laughs> life, but. <laughs> I, I, I think uh, the first three years project.com, indie interfaces, uh, dot com or dot ca um but those are all promote in the bio for the talk there and just, yeah but always ping me if you want to talk about the the dark futures of work <laughs> uh, we're also revising the door website right now but door.ca you should be able to have more and we're launching the full curriculum soon and working with the black cultural center actually right now on an, ex an exhibit that includes um includes the vr so that's exciting. So if you happen to be in Dartmouth uh, starting in February, you'll be able to experience the exhibit. Awesome. Thank you, Christina. Uh, Steve? Uh, yeah, I'm at helloworlds.ca is uh, my website for my different projects. And um, yeah, you, you can find links on there to, to contact me. And I'm always happy to hear from folks. And I, I love talking about games and society. So yeah, open for those conversations for sure. And uh, thank you, Emma, for setting this up and to the GI for hosting. And uh, yeah, that was a really good, I think, and a very timely, I think, conversation to have uh, right now as well. Yeah. Awesome. All right. Thank you so much. All right. Bye, everyone. <laughs>